I don't know if that was a yes or a no. It's working on it. Oh, okay. Now. Oh, there we are. Good evening. Welcome to the Wyndham Raymond School District Board of Directors meeting. Today is Wednesday, January 4th, 2023. The time is 6.30 p.m. and we are in the Wyndham Town Council Chambers. May I have a roll call, please? Kate Bricks. Here. Jessica Bridges. Here. Jenny Butler. Here. Jody Carroll. Here. Caitlin Downs. Here. Pete Hensler. Here. Char Jewell. Here. Kate Levier. Christina Small. Here. Al Potter. Here. Will you please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Howe, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, we do not have any changes to the agenda for tonight. Okay, up next is public input. We welcome public input. Um, if you would like to speak, please state your name and the town you live in. We are timing at three minutes per usual and we look forward to hearing from people. Anyone like to speak this evening? Seeing none, we're going to move on to the superintendent's report. Sure, so I have a couple things that I want to share, uh, not only with the board tonight, with the public uh, as well. And um, a couple things that have come to my attention and then were also something to celebrate uh, after vacation. So first of all, uh, last Friday I had sent out a letter to the community for um, recent testing results for well water at Raymond Elementary School and for Jordan Small Middle School. And I think everyone's aware at this point because of the letters we've been sending out this fall that under legislation the state passed new requirements that um, all districts will be testing for lead within faucets in all school buildings. In addition to that, any school that operates under a well needs to test for PFAS and PFAS is a class of chemicals that's used in everything from packaging to binding materials to fertilizers um, and Teflon coatings. And right now, the long-term health effects of PFAS, nobody's quite sure of. And if anyone has been following anything in the Press Herald or your local news sources, uh, it's been a subject of conversation in multiple, <coughs> multiple places. So starting first of all with PFAS, um, the Jordan Small Well, which is across the street from the Raymond Elementary School Well, tested well below state guidelines for PFAS. In fact, it was almost next to ne negligible within that water source. Uh, the PFAS level in the Raymond Elementary School Well, though, tested very, very high. Um, so that's one component of it. The secondary component is that we've been testing for lead and part of testing for lead, we know that lead was used in faucets and fixtures and other things, um, but we also received a very high lead report for the initial shutoff valve for Jordan Small. Um, so I'm gonna start with Jordan Small. Um, one reason right now why our water consultants think that Jordan Small may have done high is that what's called a dead end line, which the water doesn't actually flow, was used for the test point source and actually years and years of sedimentation from um, fixtures and other things were in there. So the actual line where water comes in and runs um, was the test point. We'll get an idea of where that is. Regardless, though, we have one building right now with a high PFAS level, and we have a secondary building which has a high lead level. Uh, so over vacation, when both of these reports came in, um, Bill Hansen, Mike Duffy uh, quickly moved and contacted Poland Spring, who was absolutely fantastic. And so Poland Spring had quickly uh, supplied bubblers as well as bottled water for all drinking water and for cooking for both Jordan Small and for Raymond Elementary School. Um, I'm gonna start first of all on the Jordan Small side. Once we get the lead result test back, um, and which we, of course we've been sharing all of our test results with the public, once we have that result back, we'll then make the decision do we continue on Poland Spring Water for the remainder of the year at Jordan Small, or do we, we go back to the water source that we were using. Um, Water can be used for washing hands, can be used for washing dishes. Uh, they just don't recommend it until we get those clear things to drink. Let, let's go to the PFAS side, which is Raymond Elementary School. So the well at Raymond Elementary School is 781 feet deep. 
Um, and though it sits on a hill there in Raymond, the water source and the aquifer in which it grabs water from, um, down at that level, we don't know where that's coming from. We're aware that SD Warren maintained some dump sites uh, for chemicals, as did Portland Water District in various areas around Raymond. Could also be further west in Casco and other places where things have made the aquifer. So we have um, employed our water test consultants to, again, we need to do a confirmation sample. Uh, but we've also started to look at um, a program where we can try to figure out maybe a point source where some of this contamination is coming from. Regardless, um, we have PFAS in the water and we need to make sure that that water is safe for drinking. So right now, all water bubblers, all places where kids can drink water has been shut off and um, it needs to come from the Poland Spring bottles or the bottled water. Uh, we learned in a meeting, today's, Tuesday, today's Wednesday, we learned in a meeting yesterday, Tuesday, we had a chance to meet with the well expert, uh, with our water quality management people, with the state folks who manage the main water quality program, and also a local vendor who deals with water remediation, that our water's treatable. And so we have given the go-ahead to go ahead with um, a charcoal uh, carbon system that will capture PFAS as it runs through and will then um, capture it over time. Those carbon molecules capture the PFAS, those, that carbon then needs to be recycled or not recycled but actually needs to be disposed of. Um, and roughly every six months those filters will be disposed of and then new filters will, will go through. Uh, because we have now tested for high level of PFAS, we, instead of going to a yearly testing on the well, we're now going to go to quarterly. And as has been our practice for all of these testing results is that we'll continue to send letters to the public to let them know each one of those testing results. Um, it is anticipated, if all goes well, that we can have a system installed, and this is kind of the incredible part, uh, within the next month. And then it will take at least a month for the system to get up and running and then also for a confirmation test on where we are with the water samples to then say that it's okay to drink. And again, at that time, I see a couple of Poland Spring bottles over there. Uh, at that time, we'll need to make a decision whether or not we continue with Poland Spring or whether or not we switch back to the water that's available in the building at that time. Um, kind of time will tell with that. Uh, there is a cost to this. And there's an upfront cost of the system, and this is a rough quote, which is about $20,000 for the install. Uh, the main water quality program has grants to support districts to help us with that cost, so it looks like that $20,000 will be reimbursed back to the district once we've incurred the cost. It's one of those things you pay up front. The carbon changeovers are roughly eight to $9,000 every six months. And... Um, that for the time being will be reimbursable with any of these water quality programs. You never know how long that that will last for. Um, but again, two segments to this one. We're looking at immediate remediation so that we can get those numbers back down to where they need to be. And the secondary part is where is our point source of possible contamination? Again, if it's further west than Raymond and other things, nobody knows where those things might possibly be entering into an aquifer from. Uh, and it may be a mystery that we never solve and we're looking to, to do the water, but we'll do everything that we can on our end in order to be able to address those. Um, and we will continue to inform parents uh, and the board as far as what's happening with that and as numbers change, but now we've entered into a, a constant cycle. Um, just very thankful for Bill Hansen and for Mike Duffy, um, their relationship with not only the well experts, main water quality, and our test consultants. Um, we had test results on Thursday. The letter was sent Friday. We had all the people we needed to have to move things in a room on Tuesday. Um, things move very, very quickly, and I'm thankful for that so that we can get things, some things in place. So we'll continue to let people know. Chris, is it only one filter? Or is it multiple filters? It, my understanding is that there's two filters that are put into series, 
and you have an initial one that does a majority of the work and then the secondary one they're both carbon secondary one picks up whatever the pieces are left over there's a testing process where they can tell whether or not filter one is starting to leak materials into filter two and at that point they actually have a way to swap them in series and then start swapping them out um, this carbon material which is now PFAS concentrate has to then be disposed of and um, that then would be our water our water treatment service would take care of the disposal of those cartridges um, the other good news is that it's technology that's been proven it's readily available to the warehouse right now has the carbon that we need has the materials that we need and this is also the same treatment service that that designed the Raymond Elementary School treatment system and Jordan Smalls uh, for both waters so they're very familiar with our system the water engineers are very familiar and so it's a quicker process than just having somebody that's never dealt with our water system before uh, and I know facilities committee has had a chance to visit the room down in Raymond Elementary School in the basement with the giant tanks that was redone this summer so it's the same firm that went ahead and did that so so both filters at the same time will be replaced or there both will be replaced at the same, same time. time yep okay thank you Anything yep. else? Yeah, I've got a couple quick other things, which are, um, once again, um, the Jordan Small Middle School has, in the uh, main stock market game, mm. uh, elementary first place for Jordan Small Middle School, which must be uh, fifth and sixth graders, second place for Jordan Small Middle School as well, so first and second. And then middle school, Jordan Small Middle School was first place in that division. I need a console. So congratulations to <laughs> all of the individuals who participated in that. Um, and they all started with an imaginary investment of $100,000. And given where we are with global news and everything that's been going with the stock market, um, we may actually have to go and do a visit with these kids to help with <laughs> retirement first. portfolios. And the, the last thing, um, that I just want to share is um, prior to our next board meeting and I'll send an email out to board members but I would like for the board to have a combined um, facilities and finance meeting uh, we're reaching the point now with our work with Portland Water District and with the town of Wyndham on the Manchester um, play fields and the sewage treatment site that's gonna be there, and we're starting to get some final plans. As part of that work, uh, we're looking to finally finish the Manchester parking lot, which since Arlington School, which used to be the dirt part of that parking lot was the Arlington School, never has been paved. The foundation of Arlington is still underground there. And so looking to finalize that, also to add a bus loop, not a bus loop, well, a bus loop and a parent drop-off loop, uh, which will be some cost to the district because they have nothing to do with what Portland Water District's looking to do and also with what the town's looking to do. Uh, and so there'll be some expense to the RSU. And so first of all, I want to go over the project and then look at some ways that we can finance that uh, with all of things. So I know Lance is here tonight to talk about the construction project. Manchester's another construction project that's going to be taking place actually starting this next summer and then over the next three years. So be busy here and Bill will be busy as well. That's what I've got. Great. Thank you. Let's move on to board roundtable. Anyone have anything they would like to share this evening? Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Um, so um, I. Um, I was watching Monday Night Football, as probably millions of other people were this week, um, and was um, shocked and astonished and horrified to watch DeMar Hamlin fall to the ground. Um, I was um, my <clears throat> just sitting there with my mouth hanging open and then been reflecting on that experience and, of course, hoping the best for him and his family. and, and um, the um, in the news in the last several months they've been talking about athletes across the world that are having heart problems and you know passing away and and so i get to thinking about that and um, had a conversation a short conversation with um, someone um, a parent yesterday 
Um, and so one of the things that I'd like to take a look at, so I apologize for not emailing all of you because I didn't have time at work today, um, but I'd like to take a review of what we have for um, res first response uh, procedures at athletic, athletic events. Um, you know, who are the first responders? What equipment do they have? Do they have an AED? Do they have Narcan? All that stuff. Just to put out, um, maybe review it and put out communication to um, parents. Um, I think it would be appropriate to let everybody know what we have available for kids and volunteers and the public at our events. Um, it's just, it's very troubling um, that the seeming, it seems that there's an increase. I don't know if there is or not, but they talk about it in the news. So it seems like there's an increase across the world. So just wanted to bring that up. Can I just quickly respond? I was going to ask you to do that. Yeah, and it's actually, it's a great question because uh, a similar thing is, has crossed, especially as we're heading into winter athletic season and, and all the things that, that happen with that. Um, so we, we do um, coordinate and we actually um, have a partnership with Maine Health and Casey Sinclair and I think most of the high school athletes and even middle school athletes know who, who Casey is. Casey attends and is on campus outside for every day for practice and then also for athletic events, including now all of our indoor athletic events. Casey's a certified trainer and she does carry an AED. She does carry all the necessary materials that she needs to provide initial first aid before uh, rescue can come along. Uh, one thing that we're actually fortunate with with both campuses is that um, rescue is readily available here to the high school campus and also rescue is readily available on off of 85 uh, for both those campuses. We do not have the coverage at middle level games that we do at high school games and um, that may be something that Rich would want to bring forward here and in, in the future but Casey's there. She's also provided with a gator in which she can quickly respond from place to place and each one of our event or um, field coordinators are provided with a radio so they can quickly call Casey to say we need you over here for an injury and so if you've ever been over in an afternoon for she is jumping especially ones where there might be a softball game going on baseball game going on there's a lacrosse that she's zipping back and forth but uh, is definitely something we should review with the nurses and our health folks just to make sure and then in addition to that um, which is another place I thought you might be going to at our Friday night football games or Saturday football games. Dr. Bean, as well as one of the other trainers, attend our games. You'll sometimes see them standing down to the far right. Uh, so often we have three or four plus interns that are on site, not only managing our players, but helping to manage other players. And then also for the home football games, Wyndham Rescue, attends with one of their wagons and I also noticed that some of the soccer games this year that they were in attendance um, down in the end zone ready to go so um, but happy to put something together and just a communication for what we do we yeah. also have them in the buildings right AEDs yes yeah it would be good to take a look at um, what we have available for the grades below the high school as well just since we're talking about it mm -hmm. Great question. Okay, who else has anything they'd like to share? Seeing none, we're going to move on to committee reports. Finance? That's not bad. Okay. Uh, facilities, not middle school. We're going to get to mm -hmm. that, but nothing? Okay. Uh, policy is going to meet on Monday. Curriculum? Meet on Monday. Okay. Technology? Ditto. It's the beginning of a new year. Um, adult ed? Nothing. Nothing on vocational, I'm assuming. And Al, you have any words of wisdom yeah, this evening? Yeah, a quick thing. If you get a chance, next week is opening night for Wyndham Middle School's Descendants. So it's a wicked cast. I think there's like 50 kids in it. So it, That's great. It's going to be awesome. Make sure to check that out next weekend and the following weekend. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Seeing none, we're going to move on to item number nine. I'd like to welcome Lance Whitehead, who's of Lavalley Bresinger Architects, and he's going to give us an update on our amazing new Wyndham Raymond Middle School. Welcome. Thank you. So I, I put together a presentation that is a... Does he have a microphone? Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is... A, do you know what? There's one right here on the floor. And while we're doing that... 
uh, just do a quick introduction of Lance. Sure. Lance has been working with, um, and LaValle Brendinger Architects have been working with the district since June of 2020. And um, they have been um, an outstanding resource for us and have been an outstanding partner with us as we work with the Maine Department of Education throughout our project. So that won't stretch over. This isn't turning on. It isn't. It may not be permanently on. Yeah, I think those ones. Those aren't just stay Are on, they? Christine. Okay. Thanks, sir. All right. It's on. Yep. You got the thumbs up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Perfect. So put together an overall presentation of where we are there's a lot of moving parts right now um, what I'd like to do is kind of go through the whole presentation and then open it up to questions you may have um, the presentation isn't everything we're working on because we're working on so many different things at the same time um, but it does give a pretty good update as to where we are in the process um, overall just reminding everybody this is a, a large process it's the main DOE has a 21 step process and we're only on really step five of that process it is a lengthy process and you know we're we're just getting into some of the the fun parts of it um, if you were to kind of simplify that process we're marching towards a March or to, towards a um, November 2023 referendum we've been working on it since August of 21 after that We'd be looking at about a year of design time to get ready to bid the documents and get approval to bid the documents with the DOE. Um, and we're looking at, depending on the construction market at the time, likely a 24 to a 36 month of construction um, on, a, on a new new site. Um, I'm giving that range because we're really working with area contractors to say, how long should we allow for that bid period so that we're, paying, we're not paying a premium and so that the construction market can, can accommodate it and we get good bids. Um, that would put you occupying the building in either August of 26 or 27. Um, everything will stay flexible all the way until November 2024. So when we hit that bid time, that's when we say no more changes. Um, but there will be good opportunities for educators, families, this board to make changes to the plan. November 2023, what we're setting at that point is the location for the building and the cost for the building. That will never change from that point forward. But the refinement of the plan, mechanical systems, lighting, colors, materials, all are still remain flexible until bid. If you were to look at that pre-bid period, looks something like this. We're at a point where we've done a lot of analysis, we've done a lot of site selection stuff, we've done a lot of work with the DOE, um, and we're just getting into what we consider the fun phase, explore options and start putting together a solution. Um, more specifically, we're in conceptual design and concept review. Those are tasks 9 and 10 for that 21-step process, so we're not quite halfway yet. Um, we're, each of these spots is about a three-month period where we're trying to kind of get to this summer where we'll have a design in hand and a cost associated with that design to start the review process locally as well as the review process with the state. On the site, um, many of you have been following this, but we do have a site on Wyndham Center Road. Um, the site is just beginning local um, AHJs reviewing the site. For theirs, we have a, depart a fire department meeting, I believe, tomorrow um, that or the day after, um, meeting with them to go through turning radiuses and things like that and safety for the site. Um, but it's a good site. You can see here the building fitting right in the center of that site. Um, we have good opportunities for parking and drop-offs. Right now, we're looking at staff and buses being able to come off Wyndham Center Road, down, bus drop-off and staff parking, and back out the same way. We're looking at parents coming off River Road, having a drop-off separated from them, along with visitor parking, and back out the same way. We are looking for flexibility, so we have a gate that connects those two drop-offs so that you could, after hours, be able to use the entirety of the site and use either entrance when you're not during the school loading hours or, or exiting hours. Um, on the site, you'll see you know, all new athletic fields. So there's a softball, a baseball, and two rectangular fields. You'll see a good amount of access um, areas for outdoor classrooms and outdoor learning areas, as well as some outdoor areas at the front with the Penobscot um, Land Trust that we're negotiating with. That's the right trust, correct, Chris? Presumpscot. Yep. Presumpscot, sorry. Okay. Some sort of land trust. Um, looking a little bit closer to the building, again, the very early site plans are showing those two drop-offs and kind of segmenting out how much parking we can fit, 
how much bus drops offs we need and how much parent drop off we need. The goal is to have a very safe site. Um, there is some work with the DOE that we're doing. The DOE funds portions of the site and the community funds other portions of the site. As an example, the DOE will fund a parking space for every staff member here, but the DOE does not fund as much parking as you will likely want on this site. So if you look at this diagram, you see all the blue spaces, those are DOE funded spaces, all the yellow spaces, those would be community funded spaces, so visitor spaces and spaces for events. At the same time, our civil engineers working on the site plan, we are working on what's called the programming document. So this is the list of all the spaces that are gonna be at house at this new building. A lot of this is heavy lifting from both um, Chris as well as Drew Patton, who's been working through curriculum and justification for every square foot that goes into this building this DOE supported. There's really two categories that go into the program. One of the categories is Department of Education state-funded spaces. Right now, if you look at the state-funded space, we've got about 133,000 square feet of education area. Now, when you add in um, gross, that's the corridors, the restrooms, the mechanical spaces, the stairwells that need to do that, you're looking at about 187,000 square feet of state-funded building. The committee has been reviewing proposed local funding options, and they're still refining that. They've ac accumulated about 45,000 square feet of space they're considering to bring the total building to about a 250,000 square foot building um, in that range. The long and short of that is that there's going to be 12 classrooms per grade organized into three teams per grade, and it's going to accommodate 1,200 students. We continue to refine this every week with the Department of Ed. The Department of Ed is pushing to make sure that every square foot they pay for is justifiable, and we're doing the same thing with the building committee as we go through those areas. A few local items under consideration. So I know you've been through the state funded process before, um, but there are some things that the state essentially has a precedent that they don't pay for that the community has to make a choice whether they're going to pay for as part of this build. Um, as I mentioned, there is some site parking that's going to be um, need to be reviewed by the committee to see if those will be funded. Site boardwalks, outdoor classrooms and greenhouse, those are items the committee is con considering right now, whether they would like to have them as part of this building. Um, right now the committee is, has um, been on board with doing that. There's a few areas within the building that the, the committee is also considering, and that's team and grade level common areas, which I'll show you in a moment. Community assets like bleachers in the gym, um, full-size basketball courts versus short to middle school courts, an indoor track around the gym, and an auditorium for 600 students. All things currently being considered by the committee as to whether they will be part of this project as a local funded option. So the, the genesis of the conceptual design as we stand today really starts from the inside out. Um, we've been working closely with the admin team and understanding what, how this building will operate for a, student, a day in the life of students. And it really it comes down to the nucleus idea that students will, will take part on teams. Each team will be set up into four classrooms, one of them being equipped for science lab, and it'll be centered around a team home. So this is that diagram that shows that. Um, in addition to that, been really working hard to understand what happens on team versus off team for each student. Um, right now the team diagram includes an interventionist on each team, a special educator on each team with a resource room. Each of the teams is self-sufficient in that it has their own toilets, their own storage room, their own work and copy area, um, and so that this group can function as a small learning community through most of the student's day. And teachers and educators and special educators and interventionists can all really get to know the students. So once we get to that point, we've been really working to understand how a grade level would work. So as I mentioned, the school is designed for a grade <coughs> level, three teams at each grade level. Each, each grade level is co-located so they can work as a larger unit, and they are co-located with some of their specials they consider on-team specials. That includes STEM, world languages, and art. So from there, we started diagramming out this, which I'll show you in 3D in just a moment, to understand how the building really should function to work really well for students and for faculty. That really led us into the conceptual design I'm about to show you. So looking at this kind of in 3D now, that diagram really dictated a building that would be set up where classrooms are set up around this central team home. The central team home 
can accommodate any number of small groups of students. Um, we've really, what we're showing here is, is about 25 kids, so about a one whole class, an extra class, could come out here and meet. But the intent of this area is for small group instruction work for different um, students to come from different rooms and be able to collaborate in different group settings at different sizes that aren't necessarily in the classroom. So it's pushing the limits of each classroom to be able to utilize an area in addition to just their basic classroom. Each of the classrooms to accommodate that, we are designing with some glass and some sight lines to be able to see into this area. Although middle school kids, um, by the time they leave, are fairly independent, there is still some supervision needed at any education setting. We're balancing that with the whole idea of designing a safe school for lockdowns and for different scenarios like that. So while we want the teachers to be able to good sight lines enough so they could send students out to work independently or in small groups, we also want a classroom that's set up so that during a lockdown it's very quickly securable. To do that, we've been working with how much glass we have, using things like built-in casework to create safe corners in every classroom so that during a lockdown, no windows um, need to be covered with blinds that you essentially can move to a safe area where you can't be seen from the corridor. You can see this throughout every classroom, being thoughtful about how we're locating our casework, how we're locating our sight lines, and really thinking through how these classrooms are equipped. Um, you can see this even all the way down to our science labs, and what this is a basic science lab that we're reviewing right now, and how each classroom kind of equips itself and orients itself. Now, one thing that's not shown here is the final layout for classroom equipment, classroom furnishings, something we're just getting into each of the schools I actually met today with Manchester School, um, their fifth grade team, and that was some of the first comments they had of we're gonna need a little bit more storage in those classrooms, we wanna give some input here, and we're just starting that input. The other thing that's not shown here is natural light, which I'll talk about on the overall picture in a moment. So that's a typical team pod. This is a typical STEM lab that we're working through. Again, having some meetings. We've had a couple meetings already with the STEM teachers at both Jordan Small and at Wyndham Middle School. We have follow-up meetings with them now that we've had Department of Education feedback that have modified the size of some of these areas. Um, but they are looking at a good STEM lab that can accommodate everything from robotics to minor woodworking to 3D printing, um, bridge building, et cetera. We do have a world language classroom as part of that grade level home, and we have an art studio. Um, the art teachers we met with kind of described an area that could be used for several different types of art, but that was very flexible. So soft, some soft areas, some technology areas, some pottery areas, um, all set up with sinks um, and some built-in areas, as well as some storage and kiln space. So as you can see, a lot of these plans um, are starting to take shape and starting to understand the space, but everything's still in transition on a daily basis. So when we start jumping from these types of diagrams, we now started to jump, we're just starting to get into the conceptual design. We've investigated a few different organizational patterns. This is the organizational pattern that's really rose to the top so far. Overall, we're looking at a building that sets itself up to have three stories in the front with those grade levels being on the second and third floor, and on the first floor having some of the common space that they share. So with the main entrance being here, each side of the main entrance includes the nurse's office as well as the admin student services suite. The admin student services suite includes main administration, guidance, and special education all working in a suite of student services so students can get all the, they're kind of a one-stop shop there, as well as the secure point. We do have specialty education areas at each end of that building, and we have staircases that move up and down so that each team can go up their own stair and you never have to walk through one team to get to the next. So teams would be able to come directly down to a special and go back up for specials that are off. In the center of the building, we have a learning commons that connects the building front to back. Um, that learning commons includes a library as well as the dining areas <coughs> and some student presentation areas. Some of what the educators have told us is in addition to those small meeting areas for small group settings on team, they would love to have a spot where they can pull the entire grade level together. And we've created that right in the center of the building to be able to accommodate one grade level at a time on a stepped seating presentation area. We are looking at an auditorium of roughly 600 seats 
with backstage areas, including set design, makeup areas, to make it a functional auditorium so you can do a full event just like you could at Wyndham High School. A little bit smaller than the high school's auditorium, but still a full complement of storage spaces and the things need to do a performance. Um, we do have a music suite there with three music areas and our athletics, um, our athletic suite. The athletic suite right now includes a double gym with a track around it and, a, and an auxiliary <coughs> gym um, that could be, that also has a full-size basketball court. Kind of looking at this in more detail, um, and I did bring some boards with us as well, um, and I can send PDFs so people can actually zoom in and read names on these. I don't expect you to read every name, but if you look at this layout, you'll see in dark blue some of those special education areas, including a build lab, occupational therapy, gifted and talented spaces, and in light blue, some of the other programs, including health, life skills, altitude, um, jobs for main grads. Those upper floors, those were the 3D areas we just looked at and how they're stacking up. As well, and on the other side, you'll see track going around the gym. Now at the last building committee meeting, um, we decided to start investigating a track rather than going around two gyms if a track went around just one gym to save costs, because that is a locally funded item. Um, and we're just starting that diagram now and working through that on the architectural and engineering side. We went through the grade levels and how they organize. That's the second and third floors. So I won't go through that again. And we're just starting to shape out some of these spaces and kind of fit in the equipment and the striping and, and kind of justify those spaces. But this is the main gym, roughly the scale we're looking at. The main gym is currently designed with, with bleachers for 1,200, so you could fit the entire student body on the bleacher set. That is one of the things that the committee is reviewing. The state funds bleachers for 600. They will not fund bleachers for 1,200, so that would be one of the community costs if we decided to do it. Some of these things like this are do it now or it's not something you can easily add in the future. So that's some of the decisions that the committee will make. Um, that center of the building, and there's no lighting in these models yet, so you can just see some of the natural light that's coming in. Um, the cent that central student commons, this is that stepped area that would fit an entire grade level, and we're just starting to work through how that goes together and how that structures itself. Our mechanical engineers and our structural engineers are just now getting involved and we're in kind of what we consider a large review phase. Um, we are starting to put together the auditorium, very early shots of the auditorium and how that's shaping itself out. As you can see, good size stage, lots of backstage area um, with a good amount of wing space. We are trying to keep it as intimate as possible, knowing that it is a middle school auditorium. We don't want it to be, you know, sometimes auditoriums, we want them to be grandiose and really overwhelming. We want it to be beautiful, but we also want it to feel like you could have a lecture there and you don't feel really disconnected from the stage. Um, we've had a lot of focus areas with different groups and we have several meetings scheduled coming up. Everything from how does this main entrance work from a security standpoint? This is the current main entrance in some of the areas we've been working on, but making sure that people could enter this building, have a public waiting area as well as student waiting area that stays separate, that the SRO has good adequate sight lines to be able to secure that main entrance, and that the office itself as well has good sight lines to both inside the building as well as outside the building. With the committee, we're, we're working through the library. We had one meeting today at Manchester School. We're going to have several meetings with librarians from each of the other two schools to understand how the library should function. Um, that's We're looking at what areas of the library should be enclosed. I believe the committee's um, suggestion was entirely enclosing the library, even though it's close to that student commons so that it can have good acoustics around it. Um, and we're going to review that with the librarians the next couple weeks. I think we're going through the administration areas and we're going through the overall site areas. So it's connection to the site while we're still reviewing with AHJs, authorities having jurisdiction to understand to make sure we got safe routes. We are starting to get to a point where we are massing the building up and understanding how big this building is so we can start working on the exterior design. A really important part of our exterior design is ensuring that we have really good natural light for every education area in this building. Um, that's why we're stretching this across so it has a lot of south light, which helps us for good natural light, but it also helps us for energy consumption. Um, south light is the best light we can have in this region for um, heat absorption. We really like the heat absorption in the winter and not in the summer, and that's why south's great. North light is great light for education as well because you're never getting it directly into the classroom, but you're getting a good, nice, subdued light that's great for reading, great for learning. 
So that's why our building is really pushing itself to be north-south um, open. If you look at the scale of the building, 250,000 square feet is a significant build. Um, and we're trying to make sure we break that scale down. They're just kind of looking at different views of this building. We're also trying to make sure it's very efficient, that it's not long wandering corridors, that it's as short a distance, travel distance as possible for this age group. Um, just giving a sense of scale to the building is really easy to lose scale when you're designing a building 250,000 square feet, but there's roughly the size of a person compared to the building and roughly the size of a school bus. So it's going to be a significant building. Um, those are those first views. If you are coming in on a, if you're coming in as a parent, this would be your first view of the building. If you're coming in as a school bus, this would be your first view of the building. So trying to get um, kind of an equal view there and then having a main entrance that's not overwhelming, but that does have some cover. So while we're just beginning design, we took the opportunity to meet with students at Jordan Small and students at Wyndham Middle School and ask them what they like. Um, we showed them a very large slideshow and asked them to give us thumbs up, thumbs down, and then articulate what they like and what they don't like and why. Um, I have a brief slideshow for that distilled down for this group. These are some of the things that they, that they liked. Um, for the exterior, they had a lot of different tastes, but they liked images like this, and what they articulated is, we want an area that we have some place to sit down, some place to wait. They liked that this image particularly showed some benches. They liked that when they approached the building, they knew where the entrance was, that it looked very welcoming to them, and that there was, an, that there was um, a lot of connection to nature there. They said they just don't want a kind of a hardscape feel to everything, and they liked that image in that, that sense. They also liked this image for a lot of the same reasons. What they reacted to here was, it doesn't look overwhelming. It looks like there's a lot of spots to sit down. This looks like there's good natural light. There's a natural feel. And there's a spot that I can sit down with my friends while I'm waiting to get picked up or just arriving. From interior spaces, they, they liked images like this that had good connection to the outdoors, lots of natural light, um, when we showed them different color, they actually said, we like color on the furniture, but the building we like fairly neutral. Um, they, the big thing for most of the images is, it looks like there's adequate space for me to get around things. It looks like I can have good sight lines and I'm never gonna be anxious about how do I get through this building, so obvious wayfinding. And that was why they really liked this image. A lot of the students said, right when I walk into this building, I feel like I can see my friends, I can see where my first class is. I can see where I need to go. There's an obvious you know, sense of how this building lays out. It's open and airy, and I can choose to either hang out with my friends or go to my class. They liked images like this because they said they, they liked just the seating options, having a little bit of flexibility so that they could sit in different types of spaces in different size groups. They liked the feeling of it being warm and cozy and relaxing. They liked images like this Primarily, they liked the warmth of the wood, but what they saw, we met with each of these students in libraries, and every one of the libraries, they looked around and said, we don't have that much space between our furniture now. Um, we have a hard time getting through the library. What they liked in particular, and all the groups like this and commented on this, is you could walk through this library even when it's furnished. It doesn't feel overcrowded. <coughs> so that was kind of what our takeaways for them were, don't overfurnish a space and make sure the spaces are adequately sized, and not just packed in. Um, they liked even small areas like this, giving them some flexibility to work outside a classroom, to work independently, um, to have some study spots, and even some small private spots like this where they could go to um, and, be, and just work independently or work with a friend or read. When it came to classrooms, they liked some like this. Same type of idea. Looks like it's good sized and it's got a lot of natural light. This was probably the number one liked classroom of the day for all four groups we met with, and they all said the same thing. Good natural light, good views out, um, really hot topics for them, and then enough space to get around the desks. Probably their most liked image of the day was the idea that there would be an indoor track. It's something that the committee continues to work on and evaluate the cost of. A very popular spot, both amongst students as well as amongst faculty when we initially met with them they said this would be you know, kind of a, a dream thing for them to have of be able to walk during their breaks um, and have some indoor track areas that could be both community 
um, in student and faculty use. When we showed them various types of auditoriums, this was their favorite auditorium they saw. They thought this one was not over the top, but had some pretty cool color. Um, they liked the color changing lights. They liked the idea that it looked like a true performance space, not just a meeting hall. They also liked pretty much every type of outdoor learning space. So they, when we showed them small spaces like this, they said, yes, please build us some of those, just you know, <laughs> two or three. When we showed them big spaces like this, they said, yes, yeah, some of those too. We want those as well. Now our site is unique in that we have opportunities for boardwalks. We don't have standing water quite like that. I know we do have wetland areas, but they're actually vernal, which means a lot of the year they look like a field. Some parts of the year they look like a wetland. Um, but we will have an opportunity to do some raised walkways. So knowing all that, our next big steps are getting educator and um, administrator feedback. Um, we had our first one today where we gave um, this update to Manchester School. We have several follow-up and to-do items from that meeting. Um, we meet with Window Middle School faculty meetings all day on the 13th, Jordan Middle School all day on the 20th. Um, we have some RSU meetings on the 26th, and we have Jordan's, um, we have an update for Jordan Small and faculty update on the 1st. Sorry, that not the, the RSU, was the 26th actually just on WMS. Um, that's an update for them um, to see you know, what their feedback bore. We have Department of Education meetings coming up as well. Those are undetermined. They've given us a list of feedback they would like us to address before we meet next. We have building committee meetings tenderly scheduled on the 19th and scheduled on the 2nd. Um, and our goal is to continue to refine this. I will tell you that since these images were put into this slideshow, our plans are considerably different. Every day we make progress and we're trying to take that feedback to heart and make the changes as we go and constantly work through to get to the right concept. Our goal is to have it to a point where we can send it to our first estimate in April through May so we can have a construction estimator put dollars to everything. That'll be the first time we start talking numbers. Um, from there, we'll make refinements and we'll do that again so this summer we can start promoting the plan and refining the plan and getting ready for um, DOE approvals as well as community approvals. So with that, that I'll, it? Yeah, I'll turn it over. <laughs> That's to a lot. That's, uh, it is a lot. <laughs> Any questions from the board? Yep. Um, so one of the things that I appreciated you talked about was security of um, students and staff and, um, and having clear sight lines and things like that. So not only for security, but because kids are kids and they'll do stuff that they shouldn't do from time to time. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things you didn't touch on was bathrooms. Sure. Um, so my question is, what are we doing about bathrooms? Because I know in the high school, I have a daughter in the high school, bathrooms are an issue, bathrooms are a problem. Um, and the activities that happen in those rooms, because yeah. you can't have oversight, right? Or it would be very complicated to have oversight. So, and my guess is that middle school is, the, some kids would be doing things that we'd rather them not be doing in the bathrooms. Um, so I wondered if that's being discussed at all. Yeah, we've had a, a couple good meetings with the, the uh, leadership teams to talk about restrooms. As fun of a topic as it is, it is an important one. Um, right now, what we're doing is all restrooms for, for daytime use are going to be individual users, so single-user restrooms. Um, each team has their own. Right now, we've set up for three, so there will be two restrooms um, set up for students and one set up for staff only. Some of the feedback we're getting is, is, is that enough? And we're, we're testing that with some of the other schools that have been recently done to say, did you put in enough restrooms? Um, a general rule of thumb usually is about one per 100, and we're considerably above that. Um, but of course, when you need a restroom, you need a restroom, and three for 100 people, um, that's what we want to test. Our goal is to set up every restroom <coughs> to be gender neutral, non-gender specific, and to also cut down on the amount of what goes on a restroom allowing only one person at a time. Our goal is to be able to have a sight line where we can see somebody going into the restroom since we can't see inside the restroom to cut down on any bullying that would happen, things like that. I think it's best practice for most schools now are moving towards either restrooms that have clear sight lines into most of them or single user so that we cut down on that bullying. Um, 
it is something we've thought a lot about. And even in speaking with the um, Wyndham Middle School team, when they had spoke with students and faculty, most of the time students are heading to the restrooms, they're actually not using the restroom. They're going in to check their hair to, or to just to get out of the classroom for a minute. We're trying to cut back on some of that. So we said if restrooms aren't a hangout, if restrooms aren't a problem spot, then maybe the, the restrooms would be more functional. Um, so that's our approach right now. We are still locating a lot of those restrooms throughout the building, but we have given a lot of thought to it. Um, and I think the single user rooms are where most school districts are headed now. Um, in addition to the restrooms, there will also be bottle fill stations and drinking fountains to serve that need. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had already or at some point in the process um, consulted maybe custodial staff or head custodians to make sure these are maintainable spaces. Um, a lot of that soft furniture looks cozy and makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so right now we have not, but we will. Um, we haven't selected materials, to be honest, yet. We are, we've had some conversations with Bill Hansen, who has been an excellent resource. And he definitely does have an eye on what is this, you know, what is maintainable versus what is not. He's actually working on a performance specification for us to follow moving forward. And I look forward to seeing that. I know he's got that mostly done. Um, he has a lot of criteria in there based on past maintenance, of the building, everything from flooring types to furniture types to, to roofing types of what he expects for those finishes. Um, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. We absolutely will include them in the process. Anybody else? <coughs> Thank you very much. Absolutely. Very exciting work, and I'm sure we'll hear more from you later. Yeah, like I said, mm -hmm. everything changes on a daily basis, so we look forward to giving you some updates as to what that input, input it's exciting. does. exciting. Thank you very much. Absolutely. We're going to move on to item 10, middle school staffing. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Howe. And this is staffing for the new building, by the way. So this, this conversation is timely because as Lance um, started to allude to, we've been in this process working through with the Maine Department of Education on an overall building design. And that overall building design and those space allocation are all based on employees that we have or employees that we plan to have. So a big component for the DOE is that they do not want to design and pay for a space that no one's actually gonna occupy. So as we've been working through, and again, it's this, this um, I don't want to call it negotiation, but it's a design process looking to determine um, what are all the possible staffing needs that we'll have, what are those possible spaces, and then ultimately, if we have somebody that would be occupying a space then that within that space, then they will help support through financial means um, that space being built. We had a chance to talk a little bit about this back in August when um, Peter and Drew came and presented the educational specifications for the building, just talking about some of the staffing needs and some of the things that we're going to need moving forward as we look to, to do a building. So a couple things that I just want to remind the board about before we um, jump into the diagram that I provided for you. So fall of 26, when we get ready to open a new building, there's going to be all sorts of moving pieces pieces that are going to be happening within the district. So first of all, um, grade three will leave Wyndham Primary School and will head up to Manchester. Manchester will become a 3-4 school. Uh, grade five will leave Manchester School and head to the new middle school. And so we know that we have some movement there. Uh, it's also hopeful in the fall of 26 when all this open that we'll be adding pre-K to Wyndham Primary School. So now we're going to be moving from a K to three school to a pre to K to two school. 
uh, all at the same time, so all these different moving pieces. Uh, grades six through eight in Wyndham will move to the new building that Lance just went over, and grades five through eight in Raymond will also move, and they'll be heading to the new building. So in addition to not only staffing a new combined middle school, we also need to consider that we're adding the possibility of 200 to 225 new students to the district through the pre-K program and making sure that we can adequately meet their needs through an educational program. Uh, in addition, we have grade five students at Manchester who have a different program than grade five students at Raymond Elementary, I mean, at Jordan Small Middle School. So if you are at Manchester School, you have a traditional elementary applied arts program where you may go see your art teacher one day a week, you may go to PE one day a week, you may have music one day a week. Instead now we'll be looking to move to possibly a trimester or semester schedule for students, which means there's gonna be greater contact time meeting that we're also going to need additional individuals. So we have a grade level changing models, and you also have the addition of elementary school, uh, pre-K students to an elementary school, and having to meet their, their needs. So it's going to require some staffing changes, and, and why this discussion is important tonight, and really what I'm looking for from the board is just a kind of a general consensus of that you understand what's going on <coughs> and a general level of support. I'm not asking for a vote. Uh, because with each of the additional positions that we're talking about is that we're talking about the possibility of space that would then be supported by the main department of education um, so we're going to have a model change and i think part of the hard part here is that um, we're talking about a building that doesn't exist and probably won't exist for a few years we're also talking about decisions that you are under no obligation to approve in the future but just looking for a general consensus that you understand that this is a need that we're gonna have. So the way the chart is set up is that um, when you see an asterisk, that's an, an issue or a staffing um, component that's gonna be addressed through just regular enrollment of enrollment changes that we're predicting. Uh, anything that's in green represents staff that will be looking to move to the new building. And then anything in red is a highlight area, which means that we're going to need additional staffing in the future in order to be able to meet this. So, um, for instance, um, administrators, we have two administrators at Wyndham Middle School, one at Jordan Small. We're going to have three in the new building. That's what we're proposing at the moment. Uh, for secretaries, two at Wyndham Middle, one at Jordan Small, um, and having three in the new building. Notice Manchester right there in that particular sheet has an administrator that, I mean, there's two administrators at Manchester. You could say one's for fourth grade, one's for fifth grade. Now Manchester's going to be one for third grade, one for fourth grade. You're still going to need to have two administrators in the building, so we're not looking to make a change. Uh, school counselors. We're going to be going to a school of close to 1,100 students, and the um, National School Counselors Association recommendation is roughly one counselor for every 250 students, school counselors. So looking to, right now we have three and a half that service that particular population. We'd be looking to keep status quo for Manchester and then the addition of a, an additional counselor at some point into the future to bring four counselors. Uh, for fifth grade, fifth grade uh, we're looking to have 12 teachers in the grade level something that Lance didn't talk about tonight is that uh, much of what's been discussed has been four-person teams we've also had some rich discussions in our planning <laughs> of maybe fifth and sixth grade should be two-person teams instead of four-person teams because in the way that those classroom pods or those team pods are set up you can easily take the four classrooms and have two different teams actually separate and share the same pod uh, so looking at maybe not scaling up till students get to seventh grade or eighth grade for the number of teachers that they have. The model and the building design uh, will take care of either. So notice there it shows 12 teachers in each for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. Just looking at our enrollment projections and where we're going to be in 26 and 27 uh, in the upcoming budget. I know I need to add an additional teacher at sixth grade at Jordan Small, so we'll already be at 12, even though we have 11 there now. Uh, and we're anticipating across the board for the district by the time that this building opens, we will all already have addressed those within the budget uh, moving forward. Uh, other components that are here, uh, gifted and talented, 
Yeah, right now we have one and a half serving Wyndham Middle School, Jordan Small. Uh, we're looking to bring that to two, so bringing that up a half. Um, the other larger components, and Lance described that within the, um, his presentation tonight, we're looking to have an art teacher per grade level. And so right now we have three and a half art teachers that cover this particular population. We've got to leave half of that art teacher at Manchester School, so just an additional art teacher within this, uh, including an additional STEM teacher, which is um, science, technology, and engineering. Uh, right now we have three, and so looking to expand that model. Uh, a component that's come up in district conversations in the past, which has been uh, where do we, how do we expand our foreign language offerings? Many districts around us actually have foreign language actually starting as early as the elementary level. Um, looking at opportunity to either add a foreign language or a computer component to the applied arts program as we bring fifth graders into a regular applied arts. Uh, right now we only have um, roughly two foreign language teachers across our two middle schools. And so looking at adding an additional two over the upcoming years as we look to open. And other components here that I've included, which is special education. Right now we have 12 teachers, roughly one per hundred that are currently servicing and working with students in this, in this particular population between the two schools. I didn't include Manchester on that because that would need to remain the same. So looking to maintain that ratio, bringing the two nurses from the two schools. Uh, the support tech is the receptionist at Wyndham Middle School. The two librarians and then also the tech support is um, Peter Mullen who handles the computers for uh, the middle schools, bringing that position over. This does not include custodians, it does not include ed techs, does not include all those other components just because of um, ed techs tend to be a little bit more flexible based on student need and custodians will be moving everybody from uh, Wyndham Middle School and Jordan Small uh, and looking at whether or not that's adequate in order to cover the space and part of that's hard in the discussion because we haven't had a final design space yet. So the discussion is timely because we're looking to finalize square footage uh, with the main Department of Education and I think again what's hard here is that we're looking for help with staffing for a building that doesn't exist and a program that doesn't exist and won't exist for another three years. Uh, but what I'm looking for is just a general consensus that uh, through the upcoming years as we look to open this building and look to do the program that we'll be at least considering and looking to address foreign language, the additional STEM and the additional art teacher and the additional school counselor, uh, especially as we add 200 more students or 225 more students. Uh, with these particular additions, it would not impact what you're currently offering for applied arts at Wyndham Primary School, Raymond Elementary School, or Manchester School, but would allow for all those additional students to come in to the district and then also meet the needs of this new building. Chris, what, um, I appreciate that this is taking into consideration when we open. But my understanding is we're waiting for demographics for future years. Mm -hmm. And how does that impact the build? And do we have that information? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, right now, we have for a population study, uh, we have a NESDEC study that was done in 2018, 2019, uh, which puts our DOE design space at around 1,130 students. Uh, as Lance described tonight, the way that this building is structured, it's built for a maximum of 1,200 students. Um, anything beyond 1,200 is going to be getting a little bit tight. If you look at our kids that are in chairs right now in the district, we're probably in that 1080 to 1090 at opening, uh, so close to 1,100. This building will be larger than Wyndham High School population-wise just because um, when, Ray, when Raymond students get to high school, there's Raymond Choice, so you automatically peel off four grade levels of students. Uh, there will not be choice, and so you'll end up with a bigger high school, actually with a greater square footage, um, which is going to require additional staffing. And part of it, again, is you're adding 
public pre-K, which is outstanding. I mean, right now we have 90 people, I believe, close to 90 on a waiting list um, for pre-K. <coughs> In addition, um, so adding that pre-K component and then also adding for fifth grade a full applied arts schedule versus a one day a week applied arts schedule with a, with a more um, integrated and greater contact time. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, to kind of tag onto your question, Kate, um, we don't have the updated um, study mm -hmm. that we need for population numbers, but anybody that's driven through Wyndham for more than two seconds realize there is a lot of building going on. Um, <clears throat> has the town of Wyndham given um, you any indication of how many people they think are going to be moving into town and how many of those people have kids and how many kids they have no idea no we've 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 commissioned a study we've signed a contract for a study um, we've had the main department of education reached out to the person who does the study who is considered to be the expert we're still waiting on that study to be completed uh, Town of Wyndham has given us some indication just based on the types of houses that are being built, whether or not they're family oriented or older couple oriented. Uh, but as far as actual numbers go for who might be occupying, um, theoretically right now, if this were to open today, you'd have a capacity of an extra 90 <laughs> to 100 students. Um, beyond that, your classroom sizes are going to get a little bigger because then you're looking at numbers over 25 in a classroom. Uh, some of that is helped a little bit by some of the pullouts, but um, something it, to think about. It just, it just makes me nervous um, that we don't have a solid forecast with all the construction that's going on in the apartment buildings that are going in. And um, it would be awful to spend all this money and mm -hmm. build this beautiful school and then have to put up within a couple of years um, yep. portable classrooms. That would be awful, awful, awful. So. I agree with you 100%. So what I'm looking for tonight is also to have this entered in the minutes so that we can present this to the Department of Education as well. Um, so, so what do you need, a head nod or? Head nod would be great that boards in support of at least moving forward with this as a model. Um, or a raised hand. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you ultimately will need to make these decisions and budgets moving forward. It's, there's nothing here that actually um, you will not be held to this decision in the future, but it just helps with planning. Perfect. I think you've got what you need, yep. right? Excellent. We're going to move on to item 11, Wyndham High School New Courses of Study, fall of 2023. May I have a motion, please? Come on. <coughs> I move to accept the new course offerings. Would you like me to read it left to, to right in full? Yes, okay. please. Sustainable Agriculture, Science, grades 11 to 12, full year, one, semester 0.5. Military History, World History, grades 11 and 12, full year, one. Magic Monsters and the Macabre, English elective grades 11 and 12, semester 0.5. Algebra for the Trades, Math, Grades 11 and 12, Full Year 1, Semester, 0.5. Intro to Modern Band, Fine Arts, Grades 11 and 12, Semester, 0.5. Fiddle, Fine Arts, Grades 11 to 12, or pardon me, 10 to 12, Semester, 0.5. Jazz Band, Fine Arts, Grades 10 to 12, Semester, 0.5. Freshman Concert Band, Fine Arts, Grade nine, full year one, freshman orchestra, fine arts, grade nine, full year one. Second. Well done. All those uh, public comment first. Uh, Maj Gavoni, Wyndham. Um, I just wanted to thank Ryan, uh, the principal at Wyndham High School, for coming up with this. I think this is excellent. Um, he has said in the past he is trying to find more things for kids to do other than be in study halls. Um, and I think he's got some stuff here that would really interest a lot of the kids. So kudos, kudos to everybody at the high school. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other public? Okay. Board discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. 
Item 12, policies. May I have a motion, please? I move to approve the second reading of policy IMG, Animals in Schools. Second. Thank you. Any public comment? Board discussion? All those in favor? May I have another motion, please? I move to approve the second reading of IMGB, Use of Animal Assisted Therapy, AAT, Dogs in School. Seconded. Public comment? Hi, Rebecca Cole, Wyndham Primary School. I'm here to speak in support of the implementation of therapy animals in our schools. Highlighted by the pandemic, we recognize the importance of addressing the social and emotional, and I would venture to add physical well-being and needs of all of these people in our learning environments. I'm sure you've already been made aware of the many benefits and the positive impact of hosting such a program through the advocacy of community members, such as the young people who are here tonight and also um, myriad professional resources, studies, research, and other um, avenues of that learning. I'm here not only to acknowledge that potential, but also to attest to the safety of the implementation of such a program. As one who has myself trained my own dog through the extensive requirements of that rigorous certification, I want to assure anyone who hesitates to endorse this practice that therapy animal programs do not only require strict adherence to training protocols for handler and animal, Everyone who shares the environment is part of training which ensures the highest degree of safety for everyone who may be directly or indirectly impacted by the implementation of that program. Host facilities are supported and indeed required to follow clear, careful protocols in order to retain their ability to participate. Uh, someone who has um, gone through that training myself with my own animal, I know there's often a misconception that emotional support animal is synonymous with therapy animal. Nothing could be further from the truth. An emotional support animal does not require the same level of training nor expertise by the handler as one that's involved in a recognized program. Um, I just want to also add anecdotally that in my experience, the visits that my dog and I made to the Barron Center and to Maine Medical Center um, were not only therapeutic for me, um, or for the um, residents, but also for me as um, someone who was able to contribute to my community in that way. Um, I just want to thank you for your sincere consideration of adding this um, to our district and being part of the growing list of those who provide this highly beneficial opportunity to their learners and school communities. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Board discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Another motion, please. I move to approve the second reading of policy IMGBR animal assisted therapy dogs procedures second public comment for discussion can i make a comment sure i just wanted to thank because i wasn't here at the last meeting and i was at the policy meeting where i had a lovely presentation on this i just wanted to thank you guys for your hard work on that any other discussion all those in favor we have some official policies. Okay, we're gonna move on to the report of the secretary. May I have a motion, please? I move to approve the minutes of the December 21st, 2022 meeting. Second. Public comment, board discussion. All those in favor? Um, wow, we're ahead of the game. A motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the regular meeting. Seconded. All those in favor? Thank you and good night.